is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood singing you this song I'm waiting at the cross and all the world holds dear I count it all as lost for the sake of knowing you for the glory of your name to know the lasting joy even share
this passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bound, for all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of Like a fire in me, like a fire in me. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We, we thank you for this time, Lord, for bringing us together and putting these songs on our hearts, Lord, that we could we could sing these songs and, and not only worship you, but make these our prayers, Lord, that, that we want to see every knee bow down and every heart to believe in you, Jesus. And Father, so we just... We want to glorify you, Lord. We want to live in you and you to live in us, Lord. So we just thank you for this time that we come together. We can fellowship. We can study. We can praise you, Jesus. And we ask, and we thank you for all these things. And we, and we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. It is a pleasure to have you here this morning. And thank you for coming into uh, Calvary Chapel. Uh, we're going to go through a few announcements today. Today after service, starting at 1.30, is our beehive. Beehive in, is an assisted living uh, facility here in San Angelo, and we go over there one Sunday every month just to give them church. And, and since nobody else is going, this is the one opportunity that they have to have people from the local community go and minister to them. So if that's something you would like to get your hands involved in, uh, please go. You'll be blessed. If you need more, if you need more information, if you need maps, there's maps in the back. But if you need more information, please speak to Pastor Robert. This Wednesday is our third Wednesday. Worship, prayer, and fellowship here at the church, 7 p.m. Please come. 
please get involved. We love to have more people here praying, more people worshiping, and, and just to get to know each other in the fellowship. You turn here on Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, please come. Another opportunity to, to, to worship with fellow believers, but to also to encourage the men to, to, stay, to stay involved, to stay connected with the Lord. I'd ask that you would silence your cell phones now so you won't be embarrassed later. Uh, and I, I want to just point out our offering boxes over here and over there. Give as the Lord puts on your heart. And, and just realize that when you give, that he recognizes. And I thank you. Without further ado, the Lord bless. Robert Monswear. Good morning. <laughs> Really, that's it? Come on, man. Good morning. All right, there you go. Man, it's like good morning, a morning. Yeah. It's like, why don't you do service at one in the afternoon? Because then you wouldn't come, because then you'd be at the beach or at the lake or. Well, it's a beach. Technically, it's a beach. <laughs> it's about 10 foot long by. Eight foot deep or something. Anyway, all right. Enough of that banter. Uh, just you know, celebrate with me because today we're going to be as soon as service is done. We are driving to El Paso to greet our son who is just coming back from Iraq. So yeah, huh? No, he was in Iraq. No, he was in Afghanistan the last time he was deployed. So he yeah yeah he he. And he called us last night from Frankfurt, so bless the Lord, we get to do that. Um, another cause of celebration is, um, you know, in spite of all the other politics that may be involved in it, that's not something that we're concentrating on, but we want to praise the Lord that Saeed and many other Americans ha have been freed from um, Iran. Uh, and was tweeted this morning by uh, Nagme that they were in the air en route to Switzerland. So they, unless they get shot down, you know, or the plane crashes, you know, the, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of stuff that could happen, but let's not focus on that. But they're, they're, they are free. So praise the Lord. But continue to pray for that family because um, we know most of us from having been in the military and stuff like that, just being deployed and coming back can really change a family that has to now have a head of a household back again or someone back in the house is helping make decisions again, and it can be really stressful. So you can only imagine all these years in prison with no furloughs no, and almost no contact what it's going to be like. So continue to pray for the families involved with that. Um, and I think that's all the things that I have to say. So let's move on uh, to today, to the book of Acts. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and I thank you so much for each and every person here. For every person that you've brought in, for every person that you're going to bring in, for anyone that's listening online, Lord, we pray as we do this, Father, that you would move upon us. As we begin to look at the book of Acts and we begin to see the amazing history involved in it, we begin to see the truths revealed in it, and we begin to see what it looks like to have an encounter with you. What the church is is to look like what the church is to be, what we are to to do as we call ourselves Christians. So, Father, as we look at this together, Lord, let us uh, let it be ironing sharp, iron sharpening iron, and that you would, uh, Lord, work in us to do these things. And Father, help us, um, help us to put off the distractions of the world right now, the things that are 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 just so bearing on us. Father, let us let them go, realizing. For most of them, we can't do anything about them anyway. Uh, so let us just rest in you right now and hear from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts, turn to Acts chapter 1. For some of you, I pray this is the beginning of, of you being able to sit in with us to begin a book and to begin examining these things. Um, uh, one of the things we see happening in the book of Acts is the result of what Luke talks about in his gospel. And um, it it's does this impact you does this impact me um and, and it reminds me of a story and i'm pretty sure i've shared this with you guys before um but when i was probably about 10 or 12 years old uh, my parents had gotten me this awesome five-speed bike 
Okay, so I love this bike. I loved it, um, and it was it had such balance and control on the handlebars. I could ride everywhere without using my hand, and I would. I would ride all around our neighborhood and all around. You know, I'd ask my mom every day, "Do you need me to go to the store?" Because I'd want to drive to the convenience store and get her something so that I could, you know, ride my bike. Well, one day as I was riding my bike, and I was going to the convenience store, and I was riding with no hands as I was counting my change to go to the store and seeing what I could afford to buy. As I'm pedaling, I'm not looking at the road because I'm familiar with my road. It's my neighborhood. I know where I'm at. You know, I, I even know I'm at the curve and I need to go around the curve. And, you know, I don't even look up for that. And I'm doing it and I'm counting my money. And then I look up and there is a Mack truck in front of me. And I slam into it. I hit it so hard, my bike becomes no longer capable of driving with no hands. And I hit that truck, and I bounce off of it, and every bit of change I had in my hand goes flying all over the place. And then when I come to, I realize that a trucker who lived in the area had simply just parked his truck slightly on the road. But when I hit that thing, man, I, in my head, I was like, yeah. I'm going to die. That's exactly what I thought, but I didn't. I was alive, and I was like, oh, oh, and I cried, of course, because my bike. I didn't care about me, really. It was my bike. My bike. <laughs> you know, my dad's going to kill me. My mom's going to kill me. Oh, my bike. And But it, it's one of those memories that I have that I still have, and when I close my eyes, I can see that Mack truck right, can, right in front of me. You know, I really can. And that's the thing. When you see these guys in the book of Acts, when they come to this, the fallout, what you might call it, of resurrection, these guys come to this and they're just like, oh, oh, I just had dinner with Jesus. You know, he was crucified. He was dead. I saw him wrapped up. I helped put the spices on his body. And now I just had dinner with him or I just had breakfast with him. Or I just watched him chew Peter out again, right? And, and, and these guys, man, they come into this, and, and they don't look at Christianity as just a religious system or a workout system or if I do good or if I do this. or You know, it's not a point system on me trying to earn stuff with God. You know, it's not a set of rules to enhance our karmic output. You know, it's none of that. It's free, and it's easy, but yet at the same time, Time it costs everything. You can put that first graphic up. G.K. Uh, Chesterton said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. No, the Chesterton, uh, Acts 01, the different one. There you go. There you go. And, you know, you sit there and you look at Christianity and you look at these things, you know, and we realize that Christianity, the cost, is so great. Um, you know, Jesus, we know that you know, salvation is free. But yet, even in that freedom, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. So what we're looking at here, what we're coming into with the book of Acts, is it's not just a story. This is a, a recount of reality. This is where Luke, and we're going to look at him at, in a minute, went and he questioned people. And he said, what did you see? What was happening? Tell me the details. Um, there were many times when many scholars thought that the book of Acts was like a romance novel of the early church uh, after about the late 19th century. Um, many people thought that it was written a hundred years or more after the events that are uh, looked at in the book of Acts. But William Ramsey, a noted archaeologist and Bible scholar, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the historical record of Acts is remarkably, remarkably, remarkably accurate and regarding the specific practices, laws, and customs of the period it claims to record, it is definitely the work of contemporary eyewitnesses, which is all to say that the people who were here in the book of Acts witnessed these events in the first century. In the mid-1960s, Sherwin White, a uh, uh, um, expert in Greco-Roman history from Oxford, wrote about Acts. He said the historical framework is exact. Not close, but exact. Most Jewish scholars, when they're researching history, 
actually use the New Testament to tell them where to dig, where to go, how, what to look for. Um, he also said in terms of time, the place, the details are precise and correct. As documents, these narratives belong to the same historical series as a record of provincial and imperial trials and epigraphical and literal sources of the first and early second centuries A.D. For Acts, the confirmation of history is overwhelming. And this guy is not even a believer. He says, historically, the book of Acts, in the history that it describes, in the places that it describes, in the events that it talks about, he says, happened. And he says, to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of detail, must now appear absurd. Roman historians have long taken it for granted. So as we come to read this, I want you to understand that, again, if you you wonder and you fight with your thinking, and if you talk with people who try to say things like Jesus didn't exist, the church never really started until, you know, the third century or something like that, you can just say, you know what, you're denying your, you know, your own scholars. You're denying reality because you, you just want to believe what you want to believe. And we're going to kind of examine that right now. Look with me, if you would, at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and let's just read verses 1 through 3. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Each one of those accounts are as important as we go into the book of Acts. I kind of want you to remember that um, when when we come together next week. As you turn... You know, as you're looking here and you're looking, I was going to say turn to Luke, but I'm, I'm not going to have you turn to Luke right now. Um, we'll just talk about the author of the book. Um, it's attributed to Luke. When he talks about the former account I made, O Theophilus, the Gospel of Luke begins with an address to most excellent Theophilus. So most people believe that this is Luke, the physician Luke, uh, a transliteration of the Greek name Lucas or Locus. Which, if you you know, if you were to look at it, it, there's two different meanings for it. In the Latin, if it's talking about the Latin Luke, then in the Latin it's light, or one who bears light. In the Greek, it's somebody from Lucanus. You know, uh, could have been talking about where he was born, or his mama just may not be very creative that day. I don't know, um, but we know that his name is Luke. Um, and as we talked about before, tradition, history, all those things talk about that. Um, he is only mentioned a few times by name in the scriptures. The most particular one is Colossians 4.14, where Paul is, says, the Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Um, we're going to see in the book of Acts that Luke becomes a traveling companion of Paul. So... Um, and actually, in the early church, in the early centuries of the church, Luke and the book of Acts were almost considered one book. Um, they were placed together in the Bibles uh, or in the scrolls or however they would place them. So when they would order them, after the Gospel of Luke would come the book of Acts. Um, uh, Paul mentions Luke also in Philemon 20, you know, 24, 2 Timothy 4.11, and You know, again, until the second half of the 19th century, the entire church was in agreement that this was written. This and the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke, the physician. Um, The internal evidence in Luke and Acts, uh, which before certain times were almost included, you know, in one book. um, He was a non-Jew. Many of the words that he uses are Greek or Roman in their origin, in their thought process altogether. And he actually has to like be really detailed to describe the Jewish things that are happening. It's almost like when he was when he would talk to the people, the eyewitnesses that he was getting this stuff from, he would do that. Okay, that's neat. What does that mean, right? What, I, I understand you say Passover, but what do you mean? And he would have to get those explanations. And he we see that in the detail of his writing. Um, you know, so as you look in it too, also in the Book of Acts, as we're reading. 
The reason that we think that it's Luke that does this is because when he comes into the picture with Paul, the, the, the verbiage in Acts changes from they to we. So that's another internal evidence that we have in, in the book of Acts, and we'll see that as we come into it. Um, there's so much church tradition that this was written uh, by Luke. Um, uh, about 185, Irenaeus, in Against Heresies, referred to Luke, the companion of Paul, as the author. Um, the anti marcionite prologue refers to it. Um, and in each and every case, they refer to him as a physician in a Syrian from Antioch um, who got his license as a physician in Rome. So, you know, it's almost like saying he was a Harvard doctor, right? He got his medical degree from Harvard because to get your medical degree in Rome was recognized throughout the empire, and it made you very valuable. Um, and it's funny, again, uh, that people after the 19th century begin to contest that it was written by him. But the accuracy in it tells us that this was written by someone who not only had eyewitness to these events, but spoke to people who were living when these things took place. Um, because until we actually started doing archaeological digs, many of the details that were in Luke were considered to be spurious. They were like, that, didn't, that place isn't there. That place isn't. But then when they began digging in Israel and other areas, they found evidence. You know, they found uh, uh, the, the pavement of stones. They found wells that they had no idea were there. And they were like, okay, well, maybe Luke is right on the money. Maybe this person really was in charge of that and all that good stuff, right? Um, and the funny thing is, is if you, when you begin to realize this, okay, for somebody to have been eyewitnesses, that means they saw what happened to Jesus during those three and a half years, A.D. 30, 33, right? So if you were, say, 30 years old at that time, life expectancies, it depended on how wealthy you were, what you had to do, how healthy your family was, just like today, you know? So if you were, say, 30 years old and he came to talk to you, it would have had to have been, you know, especially for the Gospel of Luke, it would have had to have been before the end of the first century because most people wouldn't live too far past that. We know that John was like 90, you know, by the time, uh, you know, by the time that came around. So that, and most people don't want to admit that. Why is that? Because then if you date Luke to, you know, the first century, then that makes the other Gospels come earlier. And everybody, everybody who doesn't want to believe in Jesus Christ wants to believe that all the Gospels and everything were written about him way after he died, hundreds of years after. But it's not true. Many of the writings we have were written within less than a decade of his death. So just the fact the accuracy of Luke and Acts attributes an earlier dating to many of the books, which is why people get in a tizzy about it. Um, and there are a lot of scholars that do everything they can and postulate theories to come against it and to try to find reasonings, and it's just insane, which is just one of the reasons that I'm glad I don't, I didn't go to certain seminaries or I didn't attend certain colleges because I, I, I wonder where my faith would be if I did. Luke is writing these books to, oh, Theophilus, wouldn't it be cool if people addressed you like that? I mean, we do that to George sometimes. Oh, George, right? But we don't mean it that way. You know, it's not an honorific title. It's just, oh, George. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do say that about some people, though, when I see them on the phone and I go, oh, right? No, I'm kidding. Not really, but I'm, I'm going to say I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Louise, I know she's like, he's talking about me. No, no, that would be Liz. Um <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm messing around. A little, some. <laughs> I know, I'm throwing everybody under the bus, right? Um, but, and, and again, if you looked at Luke, in Luke chapter 1, in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, so he says, I talked to people that saw this, and they told me. Can, and can you imagine when he talked to Mary? And she, did, and she said, this is what happened. This is what I felt like when I watched my, you know, I just, I mean, that's just mind-blowing, right? 
he says in verse 3 of Luke chapter 1, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Okay, so back in Acts it says, you know, some think that the name Theophilus, because the name means lover of God. That's what the name means. So some people, when they when they read this, they read it as, okay, this is like a, a, a pseudonym for the church, right? This is another name for the church, the lovers of God. I'm not sure if pseudonym is the right word there. Um, but some people think that that's what it means. But that Theophilus was not an uncommon name at the time. Uh, and, and the person that named him might not even been thinking of God as much as they were thinking of a God or the gods, right? But the reason, you know, and, and in letters of antiquity, when they wrote back and forth to one another, usually if you wrote something like this to someone, it meant that they had hired you to perform a certain task. So here you have Luke, and he's writing to almost excellent Theophilus, which says he's not just a plebe or something like that. He's like, he's, an up, he's a muckety-muck. He's like a senator or ruler or just really rich. Um, some people even think, and there is some like church history that refers to it. There's nothing scripturally that tells us this. So what I'm, I'm saying now is speculation. But some people think that Luke may have been Theophilus's slave. And that when Theophilus got saved, he took his smartest guy and he said, go find out if this is true, if what I believe is real. And when Luke writes back to him, of course, he says, I'm telling you what the eyewitnesses saw. The truth that we now know. Luke definitely becomes a believer, right? So we don't know from the scriptures who Theophilus was, but from tradition, there are a number of different sayings. And some tradition even says that it was, you know, for us, the church, to say, you lovers of God, listen to this. Which is, you know, I, I honestly think because he uses the title almost excellent, because you and I, no, not excellent, right? Not me anyway. But to hear this, to hear what Luke is telling us, is to be a lover of God. You know, we love ourselves very much. It's easy to love myself. It's easy for me to love my wife, to love people. But to love God, when I hear these things, when these things occur, it, there's something here. And there is, as I hear Luke talk to me from the Gospel of Luke, from the book of Acts, not only do I love God in it, but I hear the love of God. So, whatever, you know, whether Theophilus was a title of some sort, I really think he was a person because the same most excellent he uses, I believe he uses a Felix later on in the, in the, in the, in the book of Acts. You know, almost excellent, you know, because it's an honorific title. Um, but look at verse 1 with me. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So... Luke, as he's going in this, and he says, I'm, you know, in the beginning, this began, and it's not over yet. You know, it, and the, that beginning, that word there is ongoing. This is something that is still happening. This is a continuation of the work of Jesus Christ. That's why we talked about last time when we, you know, kind of began talking about how we were going into the book of Acts. Some people called this the Acts of Jesus Christ. Um, we see it happening with the apostles. So for church history, the title of the book has for the most part been called the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and, and I think there was actually a, a, a manuscript from um, the late first or early second century that actually had the title at the end of the book. You know, so we have a document, you know, 2,000 years old that tells us that was the title of the book. Um, but we might call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And as we look at it and as we look at this book, as we, as we mentioned last time, if you took the Holy Spirit out of the modern church, 
for most part, nothing would change. Everything would just keep going as it is. But as we look at the book of Acts together, if you remove the Holy Spirit from the things happening in it, the book falls apart. The church doesn't happen. So you and I, as we begin to look at this, and I, and I understand there's so much craziness about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about being filled with the Holy Spirit, about having His Holy Spirit work in you. There's so much craziness in the world today because people want to appear spiritual in their, and that's fleshly, really. But we cannot ignore the Holy Spirit. He's one of the reasons that you and I are here today together. So I just want you to understand, this is the fruition of Jesus' teaching, but not just that. Let's keep reading. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So what did Luke lead with? I mean, in the first three verses already, he's saying, you know, it's not a particular doctrine. He doesn't say, you know, in all those who came forward and signed the card, you know, after Jesus did. You know, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say all those who were baptized. He doesn't say that. He says, the, this is one of the most important things, is until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So a core thought that Luke wants you to get here, a core thing that you and I need to understand, is the life of Jesus, inherently Jewish, in, you know, entirely Jewish in thought and teaching in every way, and God has used these people from the beginning. And, and honestly, if you look at the tribe of Israel all throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, they're almost like a micro of the macro. It's like you think that you can be God's people. Here's what you would look like, right? And, you know, and, and they're like, hey, we're the chosen people. And he's like, yeah, you're really my sermon illustration for the planet, right? Because... You know, how many times do they fail? How many times do they go? But God remains faithful. It, but even in this, what he begins with is not a doctrine. It's not whether you're a Jew or whether you're not, you know, a, a Gentile. It's Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. In his interaction with us, he does it in its resurrection. And in, even in all the rejection and everything that has happened, he saves us. Isaiah 53, 3-5 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. He died. He died and He rose again from the dead. But even in this, His commandments are mentioned, right? So, you know, we might say, okay, no particular doctrine, no particular thing is said, but His commandments are mentioned. Why? Because they're an inherent part of being a believer. This is one of the things that we're going to see in the book of Acts. What we're supposed to look like as believers. Jesus Christ himself said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, you know, if you love me and you feel like it, right? He didn't say, if you love me and you've got the time, right? He doesn't do that. He says, guys, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, the, and, and honestly, when we read his commandments, if we were to do them in the flesh, we'd go, that is ridiculous and impossible. Right? If some dude comes up and slaps me, he better hope I'm not strapped. That's us. Right? That's what I'm thinking. But he says, you know what? If I'm in you and you're in me, it changes everything. Okay? And we sit there and we look at it, and you and I, again... For most of us, most of the people here, you have come to a belief in Jesus Christ. So you know He's risen from the dead. But you have to understand that, that some people, no matter what, are going to deny this resurrection. 
because they want to live like they want to live. In Matthew 28, 16 through 17, even as he's standing there, right, and they're looking at him, it says in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So, there, you know, it doesn't matter. If you don't want to believe, you won't believe. Uh, Christopher Hitchens was an evangelist for atheism, okay? He was an ardent, staunch, anti-Christian, anti-religion atheist. And he told everyone, I don't care what anyone tells to you, um, on my deathbed, I will not be accepting Christ. I will not believe in any God whatsoever. And then he actually had people come in to watch him die for the express purpose of being able to say he was right, he really didn't, the subject of God never even came up. That's how much he hated this non-existent being. But you and I have to understand, just as these people looked at a risen Christ and refused to believe, people will today too because they want to do what they want to do. And they give they literally will give eternity up to live a lie right now. To live, I want to have fun, guys. You don't understand what it's like to be young. And it's like, you know, if I wasn't old, I'd say maybe. But the fact that I'm old should tell you that I was young once, right? Yeah? I didn't just pop out like this. Would have killed my mom, right? But Romans one twenty four and 25, man says, that we can want to live in this world so much that we can literally exchange the truth for a lie. And we'll do it, man. He says here, the kingdom of God, right? He says the kingdom of God, these commandments, these, this kingdom of God that he's talking about. Let, let's look at verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That particular phrase is really only used five times in the book of Acts. Um, here in 8, 12, 19, 8, 20, 25, 28, 23, and 31. And though it doesn't appear very often, it's very central to the theme of Acts. The book begins mentioning the kingdom of God and it ends with the kingdom of God. So, and you can see that in Acts 28, verses 28 through 31. Um, and it's Paul, and he's actually preaching from a, you know, a, a home that he has rented or that people in Rome have rented for him. And he's in jail. He's chained to a jailer. Uh, you know, but it's like a house arrest. But he's still preaching. He's still doing church. He rents a home, and they have church at it. Um, and he tells uh, many of the Jews in Rome, he says, Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Uh, that's most everybody in this room, isn't it? Well, one half Gentile, but, you know, we heard it, man. We heard it. We heard it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house, and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. And then the book of Acts just stops. The documenting of it. I've actually heard a couple of pastors say, wouldn't it be amazing and awesome if when we enter into heaven, Luke's still writing and he's going, oh yeah, I've got your part. I'm writing it down right now. Because the book of Acts is still going on. You and I, as we live in our Christian life, it's still happening. We're still, we're, we, you and I, are the kingdom of God. The rule, the reign, and the return of Jesus Christ is something that will happen in this world. I want you to understand that. He says there will be a second coming. And I know it's very popular now not to believe in that. Um, it's very trendy to kind of say that there is no second coming, that there is no antichrist, that there is none of these things. But I, I don't think you can look at the Scriptures and come up with them. No, you can't. The kingdom of God will happen in reality, but He also says that His kingdom is in us. His kingdom on earth is not, you know, that we're supposed to be a Christian nation, that, you know, that we, that we do these things and everybody is run by the book of the law and all that good stuff. That's not what it is. It's you and I being Christians in this world. That is the kingdom of God. That is kingdom come right now. 
the gospel is about how you and I live. But yet, it's not experience. It's not like, okay, it's not what you eat and what you drink. Um, Paul even said that in Romans fourteen seventeen. It's not about those things. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And most of us, man, we sit there and, you know, do we have that joy of the Holy Spirit? That's one of the things that, you know, I want to look at, that I want to experience, that I want to have. You know? Um, He presented himself alive. He presented himself alive after his suffering. You and I have an amazing, amazing thing to look at here. The commands are mentioned because He wants us to keep His commands. So let's look at the detail of verse 3 real quick. To whom He also presented Himself alive after His suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So looking at it in detail, He presented Himself alive after suffering. Many infallible proofs. That word infallible is uh, tekmerion in the Greek, which is unmistakable, convincing, beyond argument. It's actually a term that was used in logic to say a demonstrative proof, an undeniable proof. But again, guys, like we say, you can have all the proof in the world, but believe a lie. It's our nature because I want I want what I want when I want it. Right, But our testimony is not always supposed to be that second coming. Um, because like that graphic that she had put up before, go ahead and put that other graphic up. That Act 02. There you go. And you, this is my Oswald J. Smith. We talk of the second coming. Half the world has never heard of the first. When we encounter people in our life, most of the things that we begin to discuss and the things that we talk about are sin. You shouldn't do it. Are you staying away from it? You know, I don't want to do those things. When we need to be presenting a God who loves people, has died for them, has paid for their sins, and rose again from the dead. I mean, the book of Acts doesn't begin with just doctrine. It begins with an event that should blow our mind so much that we can't help but share it with others. Um, I, I would say who's everybody's favorite player in the NFL, but I mean, then we just start a fight in here, right? So, but imagine for a second your your favorite player in, in in the NFL. If you don't like the NFL, your favorite NASCAR driver, you know. If you don't like any of those, your favorite performer, singer, whatever it is. Imagine they call you. Hey, got your number. Heard you were a pretty cool cat, right? And I just wanted to hang out with you. Can we do lunch? And then you hang out with them. And they say, I've got it covered. Don't worry about it. And then they hang out with you. And they like you. And you like them. Yes, you. Right? Right? And you're just like, no way! And yeah, way! And they like you! And then you go, and you, you're having this great... Would you tell anybody? You tell everybody and their stinking cousin. You know? Hey, man, go call your mom in the yard. Yeah, yeah, put me on the speakerphone. Guess who I met today? Guess who I had lunch with? Guess what I did? You know, we have encountered a risen Christ. We know that there is a resurrection. We know that he lives even now and that he has died for the entire world to save them. We need to tell everybody, right? We need to tell everybody. For 40 days, he's hanging out with these guys. It's undeniable demonstrative proof that Jesus is alive and this is the testimony. And while he's up and while he's dealing with them for 40 days, you know, he doesn't just hang out with them. He doesn't just eat breakfast and then, hey, you know, great weather we're having in Galilee, you know, and all that. He doesn't do that. He teaches them about the kingdom of God. And that's important because later on we're going to see the disciples ask him what sounds almost like a weird question. Um, But it's definitely relating to this. 
he is talking to them and he is teaching them about the reality of the promise that has come to pass in him. And you and I have this too. This is a reality. This happened in history and you don't have to walk on your own. And when you share with people, you know, yes, Jesus Christ is coming back. And that's one thing you and I need to be confident in and we need to learn. But the first thing we need to tell him is that he came in the first place. And that he has risen from the dead. And struggle with it, with it as we might, you and I need to understand that this kingdom of God, you know, is in us right now. And it is amazing. John said to see it in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus said, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You and I are standing before each other right now. And there may be some here. I don't, I don't think there is. But there may be some here who don't know Him. And they cannot. you cannot see the kingdom of God and the risen Christ unless you have been born again. Unless you have truly given your life to Jesus Christ. Unless you have truly trusted Him to save you in everything. Realizing that nothing I do can save me. It is all Him. And if you trust Him, if you trust Him, and the Bible says, if you, and this is the crux of the resurrection. This is why we hammer that resurrection. Because the Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's for you to hold on to. That's for you and I to present. That's one of the things, man, that we, we look at Jesus Christ and we don't see Him on a cross bleeding. We see Him off the cross. That's why when we do put the cross up, it's empty. There's not a person on it. You know what I'm saying? Do you guys know what our, what our logo represents? I know you do because I've explained it to you. <laughs> okay. Alright, I'm, I'm going to take you through it real quick. Again, again, the reason that we chose this as our logo as well, this was actually designed by um, a church in uh, Secret Harbor, Australia. Okay? And they gave us permission to use it after I stole it. <coughs> but they gave us permission to use it. It's beautiful what it represents. I'm going to show you. The bottom is the dove, which is a very Calvary thing. That's our dove. That represents the Holy Spirit in His church. This is the cross. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the cross that paid for your sin. This and the dove together are an anchor. He is the anchor of our soul. He is our all in all. These are the three nails which held him to that cross. No longer attached, separate, and apart. You guys... We have a treasure in earthen vessels. And he says, if my Holy Spirit's in you, it's going to pour out. So give it away or you're just going to fill up and look like a big fat sheep. Right? So give it away. Go and tell everybody. Jesus Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, as we begin here in the book of Acts. And pray, Lord, that you would work in us and through us and Father, that we would be filled with Your Holy Spirit. And as we come into Your Word, Lord Lord willing, next week we will see the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We will see You in, uh, encountering us here on this earth. Lord, we know most of us have experienced You, Lord. Our faith is not just something that comes from a book or comes from a doctrine or comes from a thought or a theory. We have met You. Lord, help us to introduce people to the risen Lord. Jesus Christ is alive. And it is that that we have our faith in. It is that that reminds us that because He lives, we too will live. Help us, Father, to rest in that, Lord. Not, not to fight and struggle with our own flesh because we fail so often and wonder, how can I be saved? 
It is not because of me or what I do that I am saved. It is because of Him. And help us to rest in that, Lord. To trust that You have saved us from everlasting to everlasting. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that is just struggling and and needs to let go, I pray, Lord, that they would find that moment right now to let go of the world, to let it go and just to hold on to You. And to be caught up in the Holy Spirit. Father, to to totally experience the resurrection in their own life as You restore life to them. And Lord, for those of us that may have been walking just Lord in our flesh for a while, struggling with whether or not to do this or to do that, and it all becomes a series of decisions instead of just walking with You. Lord, help us. Relieve that burden, Lord. You're You said that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So help us, Lord, to hold on to You and to give these things over to You and to not carry the world on our own shoulders. You did that on the cross. We lift all these things up to You and we praise You, Lord, for Your gifts. We thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, rise and do the benediction with me. All right, let me see. Oh, guys, you're going to have to push it today. Yeah. All right, let's do this. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make His face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee. Man, I hope you have that today. Have the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ living in you. Don't forget Beehive at 1.30. If you need a map, they're on the back. Real quick, question. Uh, if you can, just come up to, to Liz because she's the planner in the family. Um, we are coming back Tuesday night at 11.30. 11.30, 11.45. So if there's anybody that tends to be a night owl that could give us a ride home, that'd be awesome. Huh? From the bus station. Because we're, we're taking a bus back because we're not sure if Alex can drive us back. So in San Angelo. It's on, it's on Chadburn and the Loop.